And so this is our opportunity now as policymakers and as leaders to rebuild these systems in a way that actually serve all people. today with New York State Senator Alessandra Biaggi, who represents the 34th New York State Senate District in the Bronx and Westchester County. Senator, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here with you. How have you been doing since all this craziness has been going on? You know, I'm laughing only because um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a lot. And I think that's some of the ways in which we process stress and, and, and honestly, grief, because that's what this whole experience is putting us through all the stages of grief and by the way i just want to warn everybody um if you see a cat you know this is real life now we're home and my cats run across the screen sometimes so i'll, I'll try to avoid it as much as i can it's been really hard it's been hard emotionally psychologically um spiritually physically it's a very challenging time and and because i represent a large part of the bronx i mean the bronx has been ground zero for COVID 19 and it's not a surprise to you know, leaders like myself or others who have been representing this district, um, but it's something that I think now the world has a, um, a clear vision into. And so now we cannot avoid things like making sure every single person has healthcare or every single person has access to a healthy place to live or even a place to live that's affordable. So many people don't. And making sure that every single school has full funding. I mean, all of these things are so interconnected, especially now, and you could just pick apart any single one and watch how COVID-19 basically decimated every single basic necessity that human beings need to survive. I hear that. So um, I want to table COVID for a second and I uh, want to talk about the, uh, the social unrest and the protests that have been going on about police reform, um, among other things. So what are, so what are your thoughts of, about what's going on? I mean, listen, I think that what's going on is amazing. I think that this is, um, it, it is not amazing how the protests began, of course. The murder of George Floyd what it is and was one of the most um, devastating things I think that um, many people saw, um, so much so that we even saw, I would say, hundreds of officers be appalled by what they saw. But regardless of that, what this moment has, I think, proven to us is that people, again, are more powerful than special interests. Watching as tens of thousands of people across the United States, all 50 states, have had protests against police brutality. And it's not a new phenomenon. This has been something that's gone on for, I'm not even going to say decades, it's hundreds of years, right? When we think about the origin of the police department, it started because individuals did not want their slaves to escape. And so that is the origin of the police department. And so if you fast forward to the present time, of course, there's going to be systemic racism and incredible breakdowns in the ways in which our system has been, has been built. And so watching people get into the streets and say, I don't care what it takes during a pandemic, I'm going to march to make sure that the NYPD and all police officers across New York State are held accountable is phenomenal. And it's, it really pushed the legislature in an election year. Okay, and so the significance of that is very big. In election years, legislative bodies don't take risks. They don't do big legislative items. And this year, what that did was pushed us to repeal 50A, which was a really awful um, part of the law that protected police misconduct records and did not allow for the public or family members who have lost 
their loved ones in the hands of police to access the records of those into, into the hands of those who have died. And so the point here is we, because of the, the marches, because people are fed up because they are making noise that's louder than the police unions, which I'm sure we can get to later if you want to talk about them. They're very powerful in New York, but they're not as powerful as people. In fact, people have proven now that they are more powerful. And so their power pushed the legislature to pass a whole sweep of bills that will transform the way that we have policing in the state of New York, but we're not done. We've only just begun. It is only the beginning of this process. And you know, people who have really reached out to say, thank you so much for co-sponsoring those bills. I don't want to be thanked and I don't want to be applauded and I don't want to be celebrated. I want you to keep the pressure on. I want you to tell me to keep going because I want to go into that conference room and I want to tell all of my colleagues that we have pressure from the outside and we better show up for that call. And so I think it's a really good start but that's exactly what it is only. It's only a start to what we can do. So since you mentioned uh, the repeal of 50A, what other things that state government is working on to, to move forward on police reform? So such a good question. Okay, there are so many things. Um, there is the defunding of police, which I will clarify for people who are watching. Defunding police means reducing the amount that, that is used to fund their departments. Because if you look at just one example, the NYPD, their budget is $6 billion a year. Um, the entire foundation aid, which is the line item in the budget that will fund our schools, is not even a billion dollars, maybe it's gone over a billion dollars in the past year or two, just to put things into perspective as to what we actually value as a state. Our education is actually less funded than our police departments. So defunding the police and taking that money and putting it towards things like mental health services, homeless services, housing, making sure people can stay in their homes, all the things that actually make somebody well. That's one piece of what we have to do. And, and we're not even close to being done. The, the New York City Council passed their budget last week, but it was, it, it, didn't, it didn't hit the mark, I believe, of what's possible. And clearly that's because of, of leadership, not understanding the moment we're in and not being politically brave enough, but that's honestly not an excuse. So we have to continue to put the pressure on to defund and reduce the budget of the police. That's one. Two, banning chemical weapons that the police departments across the state of New York use. And like, get this, okay? Chemical incapacitants, which are things like tear gas, okay? are banned on the battlefield during wartime, but our police departments can use them against civilians? No, that's not, that's not okay, right? Especially watching as so many NYPD were tear gassing peaceful protesters, okay? During a pandemic, tear gas causes you to cough. It causes you temporary blindness. Think about it, you pull your mask off, you start coughing, you're gonna spread COVID-19 around if you have it. So the point is like, that's not acceptable. Banning rubber bullets, demilitarizing police departments, making sure that we're actually reducing the tools that the police officers can use, which are actually tools of war, right? If you are equipping a police officer with things like tear gas and rubber bullets and those masks and the gear, the, when the police officers go out to actually patrol they're looking for an enemy. Like, that is what those types of weapons call for. And so we have to reduce that because policing needs to be transformed and we cannot transform it if we continue to equip them with the tools that are actually just inciting violence. So have you been able to speak to anybody from law enforcement? Um, and if so, what is their general sentiment about what's going on? So I haven't directly um, communicated with one or, or, or a series of police officers, but I'll, this is what I'll tell you, okay? Um, and I have lots of different police precincts in my district. Um, the fight to transform police and public safety is not an indictment of individual police officers. And I'm gonna say that again, the fight to transform Police and public safety is not an indictment of individual police officers. It is about literally transforming an entire system that enacts violence in communities of color and particularly against black 
people, okay? So my office has received some complaints from officers who were concerned that they were spread too thin, trying to cover all of the protests. Um, they were worried that their presence at the protest would like take away from their work in the precinct. And so I get it, I understand that frustration, but here's the thing. If you do not want to be staffing protests against police brutality, then perhaps those officers should be thinking about the ways in which they can contribute to the movement to end policing systems that have perpetuated violence for hundreds of years. And so I want to be very clear about this. This is not, again, about individual police officers. This, and even though there are, we know that there are, quote unquote, bad police officers. Yes, they exist. There are bad people in every system. And so that should be our goal if we're committed to transforming the world and, and are committed to actually creating a world that is fair and just, then we're committed to that in every single system. But this is not just about one particular or several particular actors in a system. My family has had a very long service um, of, of um, participating in the NYPD from my grandfather to my uncles, um, to other members of my family. My grandfather was in injured many times, shot and stabbed on the job. And that's something that we honor as a family. But again, I know that many people become police officers out of a sincere desire to serve their communities and to help others. And I respect that and I, and I honor that, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is a system that has been created around these officers that is racist, that is oppressive, that is unjust, that is abusive. And so that is what we are trying to change in this fundamentally flawed system. And our critique, critique of the police is not about, again, questioning individual officers. It is about literally breaking down the walls that have perpetuated a system that has, that has literally killed and harmed and abused people for too, too long. Well, with that said, what do you say to the people that are pro-cop, pro-law enforcement, law enforcement itself, that utilize the, the, the situation, the, the riots and the spikes in, in shootings recently around the city, you know, that argue against defunding police or, you know, just even further, farther down the road, like abolishing it. But what do you say to those people that use those, those instances to argue against any sort of um, police reform? Well, first of all, um, I'll say that it makes me sad, and I think that's probably the best descriptive adjective of emotionally how it makes me feel. Um, why does it make me feel sad? Because when people use the looting and the rioting argument um, to basically try to argue against the defunding and the transformation of police, what I wish that they would do and what I ask that they do is to challenge themselves to reconsider that perspective. Why? Because what it signals to myself and to many people is that there's a prioritization of property over human life. Listen, nobody wants our small businesses to suffer or our businesses in the community to suffer at all, okay? No. However, it is very problematic to shift the focus from protecting property versus protecting your black neighbors and your, and your and, and black friends. It doesn't make any sense. And so I once heard someone say um, that put this shift into, into perspective very, very well, right? They said, um, the murder of black people at the hands of law enforcement is terrible, but the looting has to stop. But what people need to be saying is that the looting of businesses is terrible, but the murder of black people at the hands of law enforcement has to stop. That's the, the way in which this argument is being framed is, again, it sounds to me, it occurs to me like it is property over people. And you know, I think that if we actually sat down and had these individual conversations with people who had this belief or said this talking point, that if we really had radical empathy when we were sitting with them, what we would do is be able to make them understand perhaps a blind spot that they have. Listen, damage to property can also be a symptom of rage. And that rage is rooted in, again, hundreds of years of police brutality and systemic racism. 
but people need to refocus on the root of the problem, right? And so causing the, what is causing people to protest? What is causing people to show up with this anger and this rage? And that has been the result of systemic racism, police brutality, and serious divestment from our communities. And because I represent a huge portion of my district is in the Bronx, that is a, a, a community and a borough that has been underinvested for, I mean, just decades. And when I think about it and, and, and just really look back, I mean, it's so deeply connected to the moment that we're in in so many different ways. And so, you know, for any of the executive leaders in our government to say things like, it's, it's shocking that this is happening or, you know, we'll look into it or we'll do a study. We don't need to do a study. What we need to do is actually be fair when we are funding our communities, actually be fair when we're providing opportunities to all people, making sure that we're actually identifying the systems that are abusive and ripping them apart and rebuilding them in a way that does not allow or enable them to harbor abusers. And by the way, it's not just police, right? There, again, I mentioned this earlier, there are systems, pick a system, there are abusers within every system. If we're committed to eliminating systemic racism and, and providing justice, then we're, we're committed to that every day in every system in every single way. You don't just turn that off when you walk out the door. And I'm not saying this um, to communities of color. I'm saying this to my white brothers and sisters who may say that, yes, of course I'm against racism, but it's not, if you're committed to this, you're committed to this every day, all day, whether you're on the phone with a friend, you're at your dinner table with your family and your friends, or you're in line at the grocery store and you hear somebody make a crass or crude or racist comment. It's up to us to show up to the calls to eliminate and stop this behavior. And so I think that, you know, just going back to the top of your question, you know, pro-law enforcement um, and, and, and thinking about that, it, again, it's not about, um, the property that's being damaged or you know the one specific police officer this is about a system that has to be broken apart and broken down and this is about valuing human lives no matter the color of somebody's skin and it's about valuing their lives in a way that provides justice because we haven't done it and it's up to us to do that I do have to ask you again, what, what if they, when, when they use the, the, the spike in shootings over the last couple of weeks as well, because, you know, that's, that, that, that's a, that is a communal issue. So when they utilize that uh, for their argument, what do you say about that? I mean, that's why we have police, right, to regulate crime in our communities. But here's the thing. Let's, let's think about why are these shootings spiking? We need to have an answer to that. It can't just be this hysterical, we have 26 shootings in a night, which by the way, is alarming in every single way, right? And so why are these shootings happening? Is it related to gangs? Well, what is the origin of gangs, right? Like, let's look at that. How do we make sure that we are reducing the involvement of gangs and reducing people's desire to join gangs? What is the root? It's about protecting the, the blocks and the communities that people live in because they haven't felt protected by the police. They haven't felt protected by their community. And I'm not condoning gang violence. What I'm saying is that we have lacked this deep understanding of where crime comes from. And Every person who commits a crime is not a bad person. Using the word criminal or tagging somebody as a criminal simply because they've engaged in crimes of necessity or crimes of opportunity, because they have lived through series of, not even series, generations of poverty and have never had a, a chance, have never had anybody believe in them or care about them or see them as human. This is the root of where crime comes from. And so the, the increase in shootings is alarming, of course, and police officers are supposed to, to regulate that and take care of that. But what we're missing from that regulation is the answer to the question, why are these crimes happening? Several weeks ago, the mayor was making his rounds of calls to all of the state senators um, in, in the Senate. And the genesis of the call was to talk about the city's ability to borrow. 
because of course the city and the state have a large deficit. And during that conversation, I said, okay, the city wants to borrow. You want the state to give authority to the city to borrow. If that happens, would you be open to conditioning that on the defunding of police, the raising of revenue, and the real intention of taking that money and putting it into and investing it into communities of color, communities that have been underinvested in? And the, the answer was not actually satisfactory because the answer was, well, you know, a year ago to date, we had one shooting. Last night, we had nine shootings. And so I said, well, okay, well, what is, wh why? Do you know why that's happening? And I didn't get an answer that I felt like signaled to me that our mayor of New York City understands why the shootings are happening. And so you can't use as an excuse, well, we can't defund the police because shootings are on the rise. Why are shootings on the rise? What's going on? Is it because of the significant amount of unemployment? Two million New Yorkers that we know of don't have jobs. Is it because people feel desperate? Is it because, what is the reason? We need to know before we make these decisions. So it's not either or, but I feel like what we've done is put band-aids onto a system that is woefully broken and we are not addressing the underlying issues that are part of why the shootings are happening. What does the road to uh, police reform and just the development, simply the development of public trust within law enforcement, what does that road look like? Well, um, I think it looks like transformation in the way that we do public safety. And I think the way that we'll know we've reached the end of that road or has, have achieved the goal of public trust is when we end the violence against people of color and black people. And it's going to literally take every single level of our government working together, city, state, and federal, and federal, because the federal government does play a role into why we are where we are when it comes to law enforcement, because the 1994 crime bill in Congress actually was the genesis of allowing for police departments to be able to purchase these, or not purchase, excuse me, it wasn't purchased, to receive from the federal government these weapons of war. And so we have to really take a serious look at what we've set up here and, and start to break it down. But also we have to make sure that we're listening to the voices in the communities who have been fighting for change for years. And so that means things like acknowledging that there are leaders and there are activists who have been working on the ground in their communities for a very long time, fighting for investment in social services and mental health services, um, giving us a path forward to really transform our ideas about public safety and Listening is step number one, and if we, if we don't do that or if we fail to do that, we will not actually transform our system. Because when the governor of New York says that we should have reimagine our police departments, if we do not have the voices in the, in the conversation that are the leaders of the community, that are the people of color who have been harmed by police, police officers, that are the activists or the... the, the thought leaders at the table leading the discussion, not just participating, but leading and driving the discussion, we will fail. We will absolutely fail. And that is something that we cannot afford to do. We also have to understand that the role that government plays is, is very significant. There are many decisions about policy from funding again, like we talked about defunding the police, to accountability and transparency that are made at the very local level, city council, also at the state level, the state legislature, both the Senate and the Assembly, have a really strong impact when it comes to policing. This year, again, I mentioned this earlier, the New York City budget did not take the necessary steps to reduce funding uh, for the NYPD. And that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. It really is unacceptable because of the climate that we're in, because of the awareness that's been raised. And it's really just Again, another sign that we do not have a mayor who actually understands what is needed or, or even is listening. And again, that means that, that he has failed our city in that regard. And I believe that wholeheartedly and I've spoken out about that many times. We also, I think, need to be realistic about the fact that change takes time. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. But it doesn't have to take 50 years, okay? The repeal of 50A was pending as a bill for decades. 
that is unacceptable. But what we can actually rely on is taking a year, taking two years, making sure that, that the bills that we create that are pending right now, or that the bills that will be created from listening to people that we bring into the conversation are bills that are championed, that are targeted in a way that um, really affect and, and, and disseminate systemic racism or decimate, not disseminate, just decimate systemic racism, that we're really getting to the root of the problem. And again, not just covering a symptom, because unfortunately, government has done that for a very long time. And then after we go through those steps, although I'm sure that there are others, then we can actually say in a very real way that we are starting to get at the generational trauma that communities of color have experienced and truly start to heal these communities and make sure that our state and our cities and our municipalities are actually places where people can live freely and safely no matter what the color of their skin is. And so it's going to take time, but I do not believe that it has to take a decade or even five years. I think we can do this much more quickly if we actually have the components um, to build the process of change in a way that is meaningful. If we, again, if we just bring people to the table, create these task forces, do something that makes it look like we're doing something, that's not enough. And unfortunately, the state of New York has a history of making it seem as if we're doing something, but things are not actually really being done. They're just these facades. And so we have to really make sure, again, that even when government says that they're doing something, that we're actually holding accountable the things that they're saying that they're intending to do on the opposite spectrum of people coming together and, and, you know, uh, marching and protesting for what they believe in. We have the other group of folks that have, you know, partaken in some irresponsible behavior with the lack of social distancing and, and, and all those things. Um, <clears throat> you know, with, with, with a second wave predicted, um soon or maybe this is the second wave um how can how is the state preparing for a large a larger spike moving forward well um i think that gosh i want to start from the top because i want to just be clear about one thing um it was not lost on me that the state and the city delayed in shutting down even if it was delayed by a week and that could, you could argue that, you know, experts can argue what was the right time to shut down. Um, that contributed to the increase um, of deaths and the increase of cases in the state and the city of New York. So like, let's begin there, right? I believe that we've learned um, from that. I believe that we have created many, many different um, protocols and processes and guidelines and have really been active and taken a very active role in communicating that to the public. Um, but it is important, I think, still for New Yorkers to remember that while we're still within this, what we're calling the phased reopening um, of the state, the only reason that we have gotten here is because people have been following diligently um, a lot of the safety guidelines, like, for example, social distancing, um, wearing masks, uh, making sure that we are washing our hands, um, spraying down our packages when they come in, wiping things down, um, all of the things that we have been following, that diligence has brought us to this point. Any little slip up or backtracking of that or relaxing of wearing masks or washing our hands or doing the things that, again, brought us to this point will actually set us back almost instantly, right? And so what we have to do is keep that same level of vigilance by wearing masks and paying attention to these changing, changing trends. All right, so that's like part one. Um, I think that New York has done an okay job um, up until this point. I think that there are areas that have, they have done a really excellent job and, and a really good job um, of making sure that they are, again, um, being cognizant of the realities of this virus. Um, I think that because New York was first, so to speak, even though we know that Washington State, of course, really was the first place where we saw a spike in cases and, and it was through the nursing homes, um, 
New York really was like the ground zero. Uh, and the Bronx, honestly, and Queens were the two spots that really got hit the hardest. And so the reason why I say New York has done an okay job is because, again, there are a lot of areas where I believe that they haven't, like nursing homes. And we can get to that. But the point is that um, we are still learning from the things that have been done in the beginning. And I would not say that we know everything, even when we think about testing or um, or the antibody testing, two different things, whether you test for COVID or you have an antibody test, testing for COVID, it's not 100% accurate. Yes, it's important to still get tested, but we know that there are false positives, that there are, are false negatives. We also know that the antibody testing is much more accurate. It's a much more accurate way to determine whether you've had COVID. Again, if you've been in contact with somebody, self-isolating or self-quarantining for 14 days, there are still things that we have to continue to do, even though it's discordant to what it feels like when you walk outside your door. You know, if I walk out of my door and I go into the street, I have my mask on, I go to the supermarket, it, it's this very strange feeling of like, things are back to normal. And so like, it must be that we're okay. No, we, the virus is still very much real. Um, it can cause the same amount of damage. And again, we, we are most likely going to have a second um, a second surge of cases, and we have to be really vigilant when and and as we approach that, the rise in cases around the country um, demonstrates, I think, why New York's reopening um, has got to be driven by data. You know, it's not lost on me, and I'm sure it's not lost to many people who are tuning in right now that a lot of the cases where we're seeing these spikes are red states, so to speak, meaning led by Republicans. Um, and, and whether, you know, you think that politics doesn't play a role here, it unfortunately it does, because there are a lot of states like Florida and Arizona where you see the leaders of the state basically saying that you don't really need to social distance, you don't really need to wear masks. That's not true. We've seen actually that the resurgence of the virus and, and the surge of the virus, especially in places like Florida and Arizona and California, they're still in the first wave. This is the first wave of, um, of, this, of this virus. And unlike California, in Florida and Arizona, they're led by Republicans who have really, and Texas, have downplayed the seriousness of masks, the seriousness of the virus. And you've seen things like COVID parties and really, really irresponsible behavior that are going to cause thousands of deaths because that kind of behavior leads to the spread, whether it's through symptoms or asymptomatic people who are carriers of COVID, that's what's going to happen. I think that just to close out this point, um, New York, since the beginning of this crisis, has significantly increased um, their testing capacity. You can find a testing facility and get a test um, rather quickly. Um, if you don't have insurance, if you have insurance, if you want to go to a state facility, um, there are ways to find that out. Um, and you can get a test and find out within 24 to 48 hours whether you test positive or negative. Um, I feel like there is a lot of good being done, a lot of planning being done. I think the pulling back on indoor dining was a very smart decision in New York City and across the state because we are not at a place where we should be doing that because we know that when you are indoors, even if you're wearing a mask, your risk of spreading COVID-19 is significantly higher. Um, the final point I'll just say about this is that the governor has been very vocal about, about really making sure um, that there are quarantine requirements for anybody who's been traveling to New York State from any, any number of other states. There is a list um, that really seems to be growing every day. I believe Delaware was just added to that list. Oklahoma was added to that list today. Um, you have California, you have Texas. So basically anybody coming from this list of states is required to self-isolate for 14 days if they come to New York from any one of those states. I think that that's a smart decision because we want to really be sure that we are not allowing super spreaders. This is really what we've seen across the world, that somebody's asymptomatic, they travel around and they spread it. And then before you know it, thousands of people have COVID-19. So we have to be really careful. Um, of course, the state can put into place and the city can put into place hundreds of guidelines and they can put them on their website. They can send them an email. We, we, we can send them an email. But the reality is what this comes down to is individuals really playing their role, like you and me and everyone around, wearing a mask, practicing social distancing and washing our hands and being really clear that this is not over. 
This is not close to being over, but we will reduce the number of deaths and the number of infections if we actually continue to follow these protocols. And I wanted to say one thing because I want to put some hope into what I'm saying here because I think a lot of the time when we hear about this conversation, it feels really hopeless. We will not be in this situation forever. I know that we will not be, even though sometimes it feels that way. But until we have a vaccine, we will be in this situation. And so in order to reduce the suffering, the number of infections and the deaths that can result from this really wicked virus, being vigilant and, and playing your role is very important. I have to go to Texas next week. Oh boy. Going around the city and talking to elected officials that represent Queens and Manhattan and, and, and the Bronx, what are, you know, what are some of the areas or groups of people that have been affected the most in your district? I mean, it's, senior, it's seniors in nursing homes. And I think it's, it's not just my district, I think. And that's why I pause because it's, it's everybody's district across the entire state. Um, and I would reckon to say, even across the entire country, um, we needed a, an emergency plan for nursing homes and inpatient facilities from the moment that this pandemic touched down in New York. And we did not have one. And as a result of not having one of those plans, thousands of people died in nursing homes. So when we look at the second wave, um, of, uh, which is, again, it's inevitable in my opinion. You can argue with that, but I think it's inevitable. Um, we have to have a plan for nursing home and inpatient um, facilities to make sure that we deal with the capacity because what happened in New York was, I believe, avoidable. We had the most vulnerable parts of our population get infected with COVID-19. When they were released from the hospital, they were still positive with COVID-19 and sent back into nursing homes. Some nursing homes were able to separate COVID positive from COVID negative patients. But even in the nursing homes that were able to do that, COVID-19 is one of the most contagious and easily spreadable viruses, diseases that we have really, I think, ever seen. And so when you, again, you're indoors, that increases the risk. You have vulnerable population, that significantly increases the risk. You have individuals with comorbidities. A comorbidity, just to be very clear about the language that I'm using, um, asthma, hypertension, um, cancer survivor, cancer treatment patient, whatever it is, you have vulnerable populations indoors and you're putting them together and what do we think was gonna happen? right? We did not provide clear guidance or guidelines um, to keep residents as well as healthcare workers protected. Um, we also did not provide enough PPE. And so what we saw was that, and we saw this in hospitals as well, but we, and we also saw this in nursing homes, which was that nurses and doctors and managers and et cetera were not given masks or gloves or hand sanitizer until way well into the um, rise of cases that were happening and the deaths that were happening. And so I think that for me, what it's, it's led me to do is to be really vigilant. Over the course of the pandemic, I have been in touch with um, many different nursing homes. My team in the beginning reached out to just do like a wellness check um, into, into the nursing homes to say like, well, you know, what do you need? How, how can we be helpful? Um, and honestly, what it's felt like, especially in the beginning, was like we couldn't even help or do enough because again, the shortage of PPE was across the whole state. It wasn't just one specific area. And that was a big contributory factor. But again, I think the fact that we saw healthcare workers basically struggling to keep people safe was, was devastating. Um, from these conversations, um, I have basically come to the conclusion that there are three areas of concern that need to be addressed, okay? They are expanded bed capacity. We need more beds. We need to be able to increase the number of beds that we have in the state of New York over the past decade, yes, the past 10 years. We have eliminated 20,000 ICU beds in the state of New York, perhaps even more. That's 
part of the reason why we have seen such a flooding of and a a real depletion of resources from our hospitals and from our healthcare system. Second part is communication. Um, there has to be clear communication from the Department of Health of guidelines and protocols from the providers to the staff. What we also saw, which was really just terrible, was that the state would provide guidelines. Then those guidelines would go to the providers, a provider being a nursing home, and then the administration would have that information, but then the nurses or the staff would not. And so they wouldn't even know what to do or how to be safe or, or how to take proper measures to protect the health of their patients and, and also themselves. Unacceptable. Um, and then the third part is, again, access to PPE. So it is really impossible for essential workers, um, such as nursing home workers. Also, by the way, home health aides are, are a big part of this um, as well to follow health guidelines if they don't have the proper PPE. You can't expect somebody to follow guidelines. It's like, you know, the best way to describe this, and I said this a few times, it's like, if I bought a car from you, right? And you were like, thank you for buying the car. And I was like, cool, thanks. And then next week you made a rule where you're like, and now you have to wear seatbelts, but you, you didn't build the car with seatbelts. How am I supposed to wear seatbelts? I, I don't have a seatbelt in the car. It, it's like we created the system and then we're like adding these layers, but we're not providing the resource so that people can actually meet the guidelines or meet the regulations. And it's, it just, it's like madness in a way. And so we can handle that, I believe, by making sure that we're prepared. Um, another thing that I've done that I, I'm very proud of is I introduced a bill with Assembly Member Ron King to repeal the governor's nursing home liability provision. Okay, what am I saying right now? What I'm saying is that in the budget this year, um, there was a provision, meaning a line in the budget, that allows nursing homes to avoid, evade responsibility for their actions during COVID-19, okay? That's crazy to me, considering the fact that there are Yes, many nursing homes that are doing their best, making their best efforts, trying their hardest. But I am sure, because we know how nursing homes have functioned over the years, that there are, are probably many instances in New York where there have been improper handling of the situation and those people should be held responsibly and, and, and held, held responsible for the for the death count, for the loss of life as a result of that lack of responsibility. And so I think that giving nursing homes immunity, immunity basically means, and the reason I keep defining these words, by the way, is because I'm a very big believer that when you use words that people perhaps don't understand, you keep them out of the conversation. And I am not a fan of that. So immunity meaning like you, nothing can happen to you, right? Like you're, you, nobody can sue you or take you to court. We, we, we basically gave nursing homes the ability to have no responsibility, no accountability, because we made them immune. We gave them immunity. That's unacceptable. And so repealing that provision is a very big part of this process. It's something that I am going to continue to fight for. Um, it's something that a lot of families are outraged about. Um, and frankly, have had to endure incredible amounts of trauma because we've heard stories now from hundreds of families where people had no idea what was even happening to their loved ones. They didn't know that their loved ones were positive. They didn't know that their loved ones were as sick as they were. Um, it was re it really the stories that we've heard across the state of New York are harrowing and there are families who are demanding answers and demanding justice and they deserve it. So. This is, just a, this is just a little bit of, I believe, what we've learned from the first wave when it comes to the most vulnerable populations. But again, we have got to do better in the areas that I've just explained. And if we don't, then shame on us. What would you say that's like, you feel like there, there hasn't been enough attention brought to? That's a really, really good question. I mean, mental health is probably at the top of the list. I don't know if it's number one because we have spoken about it. Um, it is, and I'm just going to share my own experience. I mean, from the beginning of this pandemic to now, it's like a roller coaster of emotions. It's fear. It's 
um, confusion, it's grief for those that have been lost, um, it's anger towards many different entities and, and people, including the President of the United States. Um, there's so many different emotions that have been playing out and it, and it feels like, you know, the cycles of grief are, are um, defined, I believe, as um, sadness or anger, sadness, um, I forget what, I forget what all of them are, but th there's several emotions that are played into it. And so they keep replaying themselves because we keep being, I believe, re-triggered by the fact that another state has a surge or we're now anticipating the second wave or we're a small business owner and we don't know if we're going to make it or we're a small business owner and we have to file for bankruptcy or we are a renter and we can't make our rent or we file for unemployment and we can't get access to someone on the line to help us to process our claim or 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 keep going the the number of things that have collapsed are are going to absolutely have a long lasting effect on all of us and i believe that's a very um under uh, underspoken about it's not spoken about as much as i would would think it would be because the trauma that's related and linked to a situation like this um can devastate all of us for our entire lives and we have to be really thoughtful i believe when i say we i mean the state in every way that we can in providing as much resources to our youth all the way to pre-k all the way up to our seniors because it affects all of us in different ways and for children they're traumatized by the fact that they're not in school and and some people don't have access to internet and the digital divide and just like pick a topic that the real severe um food shortages that we've seen and and the food insecurity especially in the bronx i mean really this has been I believe an unprecedented catastrophic series of events that we're still going through. So I'm not pretending like we're not still in the pandemic. We are, but there have been points during this process that have, I believe really um, put pressure on the human spirit and we are all doing this together in community and we are all going to get through it that way. But I don't believe that we've spoken enough about the trauma that's related to this specific period of time. So how have, how have the small businesses in your district been faring since the reopening started? I mean, they're struggling in ways that I, myself and my team cannot even work quickly enough to help to solve the problems that they're facing. I mean, we held a hearing in May on through the Senate and the um, assembly, a joint hearing about the impact of COVID um, and the federal government's response. Um, we heard about their challenges, things that we have been hearing every day from phone calls, um, from text messages, from emails, from the things that we really, learned about in the beginning, which was the federal PPE program, not having enough um, funds, not having, not being quick enough, not lasting long enough, um, and really the struggles that so many businesses faced when it came to keeping their quote unquote doors open. Um, and now, you know, two months later, we're still in the early stages of reopening in District 34, which is the district that I represent, and many businesses are still not allowed to reopen. Um, and they're choosing not to reopen or may never be able to reopen. And I think that if we are not thoughtful about how we handle this crisis, um, we are going to see very long lasting, devastating economic impacts on our business community. Um, there are definitely programs that the city has put into place, that the state has put into place. Um, but again, they are not in wide use. And so, for example, there are only 329 restaurants that have taken advantage of the open dining program. Basically, the program allows for restaurants to use outdoor seating. Um, and 329 restaurants in the entire borough of the Bronx, okay, out of more than 6,500 citywide. That is the economic reality for many restaurants. And so the fact that that's the case signals to me 
that either one, the information has not reached individuals in a way that um, is meaningful, or if the information has reached those business owners that they don't know um, or don't have the capacity to do it, um, they don't have the staff, they don't have the resources. And so I think that looking, you know, looking to other examples, looking to other states, there are other states that have um, taken similar approaches, but our goal as government should always be to reach as many people as possible. Um, this program by, through the city is a good first step, but it's not accessible um, to everybody. And so again, we have to make sure that we are really thinking through this. And you know, just like we were talking about police brutality and, um, and the reform of policing and the transformation of policing, we have to be thinking about how we're going to be transforming all of our systems because what COVID-19 has shown us is that all of the systems that have been in place, which have not been working for most people, healthcare, housing, um, opening a small business, access to, um, to financial support, access to banking, pick a topic, has basically crumbled. And so this is our opportunity now as policymakers and as leaders to rebuild these systems in a way that actually serve all people. And that is not an easy task, but there will probably never be an opportunity like this in our lifetimes again. And we would be remiss not to use this time to think about rebuilding our business community, our healthcare system, our housing system in a way that is accessible to all. You've been able to address many things um, during this interview and I really do appreciate it. Um, so is there anything that you would just like to finish with or you'd like to add that you've may maybe feel like you haven't addressed? You know, I think just going back to the point of the mental health piece of this, um, I want to be really clear to everyone who is watching that number one, you're not alone. Number two, um, a lot of people have never interacted with government and may not even know who represents them or where to turn. Or if they do know who represents them, they feel shame or they feel embarrassed or they feel hopeless. And I just want to be very clear about the fact that anybody who reaches out to myself or to my team is not only, of course, welcomed, but there, no money, nobody will ever be shamed or feel embarrassed or have to feel embarrassed um, reaching out or asking for help. We are here to help and serve. That is my entire purpose in this role. And that I believe is really, I think, a barrier for so many people because we're not used to interacting with government or even our community members or our community in this way. We all have incredible needs and I don't want anybody to suffer alone. And I want you all to know that when you're feeling those moments of pain and you're feeling like you have nowhere to turn, you can turn to us. And when you're feeling those moments of pain, you're not alone. I feel them too. And it's really hard sometimes. But again, I know the way that, that, I, that I know that it's going to be okay is knowing that we're not going to be here forever. It's not going to be in this type of, of world forever. There will be a vaccine. When? I don't know, but there will be one. And we will come out on the other side of it. And how we come out on the other side of it will be a new world and it can be the world that we have all been fighting for if we all show up to the conversations, to the call, to holding leaders like myself accountable and to really making sure that our voices are heard because that I believe is what this moment provides as an opportunity for all of us. It's a transformational moment that is like a once in a hundred year opportunity and perhaps even more than that. Perhaps it's like a once in a 200 or 300 year opportunity to really rebuild our world. And so we ought to do that. But again, we're here to help and don't hesitate to reach out. State Senator Alessandra Biaggi, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with me 
Um, thank you again uh, for all the work that you're doing. And um, let's hopefully next time we talk, it's, uh, it's under better circumstances. I would love that. Thank you for having me and thank you for what you're doing and safe travels to Texas. Thank you. Thank you.